Brooks, you've read. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. Cool. Excellent. So uh, here's what we're going to talk about. Um, we have to start by level setting and say, how does DDL work in, in MySQL? Uh, I'm going to go over this as quick as possible, but it's pertinent because you probably won't understand the rest if we don't just do that recap to start with. Uh, then we'll talk about how Spirit works, and kind of by way of this, actually how Ghost works. And then we'll get into why Spirit's a little bit different, what it implements to be able to you know, apply changes on, on larger tables. And one thing that you'll hear me say a lot is that Spirit is symbiotic. It works with the MySQL server. It tries to get the MySQL server to do as much as possible. And so it's natural that I have some feature requests from MySQL. I have some of the right people in the, the audience for that, so like, don't blame me if my cry with my luck. Um, if the server could do a little bit more, Spirit could be even more successful. Okay, so we'll get to that last. Um, but let's start with how DDL works. So I'm gonna make this change to my table, alter table T1. I'm gonna apply one of these changes. What does the MySQL server have to do internally? Depends on the change, it's gonna be one of these three algorithms. Algorithm is the term that, that MySQL uses internally. I'm referring to MySQL 8 exclusively here, where in MySQL 8, if you wanna add a column, you wanna drop a column, you wanna rename a column, it just completes this as a metadata change. Um, I'll have a slide for each of these algorithms to, to follow with a little bit more detail, but I wanna summarize and say, this is a great feature. This really does work, pretty much as described. Um, some new ones to, to, to follow, but it also describes a lot of the changes that we make. You now, as I was kind of preparing the slide deck, I was going back through which changes we make uh, most commonly. Often we're adding columns, often we're dropping columns. Being able to do this as just a metadata change is, is really good for us. Um, the sad thing is, probably the, the second most common set of changes that we're making is dropping and adding indexes, and these have to use in place. In place is a little bit of a funny one, we'll go into it in more detail. And then the other change that we make fairly commonly is we change the data type of certain columns. Um, we don't typically add primary keys, we don't typically drop primary keys. As we migrate into MySQL 8, we did do a little bit of character set changing. But actually, you know, if I want to summarize it here, Instant works really well and it does cover a large percentage of what changes we have to make. Um, here's the nuance to it. Uh, it does work 99% of the time. It doesn't work if it's like the 65th instant change that you've made to a table. If you make 65 instant changes, it has to recopy the whole table to be able to do that. If you use compressed tables, temporary tables, or tables with full text indexes, that also uh, isn't supported to be able to do an instant change. These don't affect us. You know, maybe we're lucky. I'd say we're pretty common. Uh, the easiest way to be able to uh, ensure that you don't get stuck with a change accidentally not being instant when you thought it was going to be instant is to add this assertion to the end of your DDL. So alter table, you know, T1, add a column. I'm expecting this to be instant. I can ensure this is instant with this assertion. If it's not possible, you'll get an error. If it is possible, basically it just requires a metadata lock internally, and, and then it's succeeded. As I said, works great. Um, and it's production safe. This is like my like, tick of approval um, to say you don't really have to worry. You can make these changes largely any, any time of day. Okay, the second category is a weird one. What it means is that it's not instant, but it's not a full table copy. But the actual time that it takes to apply this category of changes called in place is really ambiguous. So when something's ambiguous where it may be fast or it may be slow, it's not safe for production, right? Because we just can't work with nuance in, in, in production environments. So uh, if I compare some various operations, you know, we don't have to go into too much of the detail, but if we compare like on a timing basis, drop index, which counts as in place, it actually took the same time on this table as it was to add a column, which was instant. Um, and similarly, if we modify a varchar that was, you know, from varchar 60 to varchar 61, this counts technically as in place, um, I know, actually, it's only a metadata change. That's a bit of a weird one. We'll get into feature requests, as I said, at the end. But um, that is not something that I can safely do on a system unless I have a parser and I figure out exactly that I know that this is going to be safe. Um, I would like to use in place. Currently, we're not using in place. The main reason why I want to use in place is when we look at add index. To add an index, it's less time than it would be for a full copy. Um, we can't do this. I've not shown a, detail, shown a detail yet that'll be on my next slide, which is when I talk about the algorithms, I'm just talking about 
uh, the complexity that it has to do with the operation, not whether or not it's locking or not. A lot of these in-place operations are not locking. But I can't depend on this, because if you have one of these changes that would use the in-place, uh, it blocks InnoDB from doing its purging while it's applying an in-place change. So it makes all of them unsafe unless they're basically instant. So what this means, if you're not familiar with InnoDB being blocked on purge, is that your system is really fast, and then it can't do garbage collection. It basically gets slower over time, and then you're effectively, you know, go into the system crawling. And you have to kill the DDL. If you kill the DDL, it's not resumable. So we just don't use uh, in-place for the most part. The last category of changes is the full copy. Rebuilds the whole table. Um, as I said, there's an extra detail here, which I've talked about the algorithm, not about the locking. If you read the, the MySQL manual, there's a separate property for that, and you can assert for this property individual. But as I said, not usable, so we don't have to talk about it too much. Um, so this is a bit of an unfortunate state, right? This is where I was getting at with DDL, where how do you apply schema changes uh, on large tables, or really any table for that fact? Um, once upon a time, when I started using MySQL, we would apply the changes on a replica first, we'd wait for the replica to catch up, and then we'd switch. Um, don't do that. Um, it can work in some instances, but with most of us switching to row-based replication, and we should be using row-based replication, it has a lot of problems when the ordinality of the columns don't match up on the replica. What I think probably 90% of you are using is one of these external tools, and they work really good, right? Where they create a copy of the table, and then they start applying the changes uh, to that copy while subscribing to updates. And uh, this is the, the category of tools that Spirit fits into. Um, if the, the name looks familiar, it's intentional. We're re-implementing Ghost. Um, we're actually very happy Ghost users. We used it for a long time. Um, where uh, we, we got into trouble is when we had very large tables with a very high incoming rate of change. So on, on Ghost, Sometimes, because it's single-threaded, it could never actually keep up with those incoming changes. And the other thing is, is that um, it doesn't support resume. So if we're talking about large tables, and it's like a 14-day migration, and it fails on day 14, you start from day one. right? And we wanted to fix this, so you start from day 14, and you can just resume that last bit. So um, as I said, kind of the story at the start, we put a cap on our teams and said, try and keep your tables less than one terabyte. Um, we've upped that to five terabytes. We hope to update that higher. For us, this is about encouraging the productivity of our teams by having what I call medium-sized databases. Um, we started actually by contributing to Ghost. That's when we kind of figured out the problem and figured out that we had to kind of differ a little bit. One thing that's different from Spirit versus like GitHub's use case is that we're a financial app. We don't use much in terms of read replicas. So we can you know, push uh, the, the changes just a little bit, um, I guess, more aggressive as we're doing a schema change, and we can allow our replicas to fall just a little bit behind, we can often make our changes a little bit faster. So that was sort of one of the, the Genesis ideas that kind of led us down this path. Um, I'll pause and I'll ask any questions uh, on the state of DDL before we get into to how all this works. Yes? Completely new development. Yeah, it's a re-implementation. How Spirit works. And actually, on my first slide, it describes how Ghost works, not how, how Spirit works, uh, which is that we copy the definition of the table to a new table, then we apply our intended alter, we start subscribing to the, the changes, we act essentially like we're a MySQL replica, then we start copying the rows while applying the changes. At the end, when we've applied all the changes and we've copied all of the rows, we're able to cut over, and we're able to say, this is your new table. Um, the interesting thing, as kind of we, we developed this, that the hardest parts of this is the cutover, um, which we're lucky. It's much simpler in MySQL 8 than it is in previous versions, where it really depends on some quirky MySQL behaviors. And uh, interestingly enough, the copying rows, being able to chunk up any variation of a table into small chunks to copy, uh, turns out to be quite a complex problem. So that describes, as I said, Ghost. Here is what Spirit does a little bit differently. Um, before it does anything, it attempts to do your DL change as an instant operation by adding that assertion. If it's successful, great. Your schema change is done. So you're going to have to think about where I send the schema change. Should I send it to Spirit? Should I try and apply it myself? It'll just basically try and do this the, the fastest way possible always. 
The second thing we do is we pass the DDL, and we try and see if it contains some very specific known safe in-place changes. So we don't want to have to do the full you know, table copying operation if it's one of these ones that we know that's safe. Uh, we find this a little bit hacky. We'd love if the MySQL server could convert these to instant. As I said, again, we'll get to feature requests in just a little bit. Um, then we do the same thing uh, as what was happening in Ghost. But just before we cut over, we add an extra feature, which is that we do a checksum. <laughs> so we compare the matching columns or the intersecting columns between the new table and the previous table and see that the data is all consistent. Question. Um, do you apply changes after you copy rows? We do it progressively. We do it at the same time. Did you both in the morning? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we have to start the subscription before we start the copying. Yeah. But once the copying started, then we can do uh, this at the same time. Right. Yeah. So you don't need to buffer all the changes. We don't need to buffer all the changes. We we roughly flush them about every thirty seconds. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. So two questions uh, related to the checksum. Yeah. Why do we do it, and what is the overhead of doing it for low state? Great question. I was about to get to that, but thank you for the, thank you for the leading prompt. Yeah, so we developed the checksum during uh, development to basically prove our work, that there were no bugs. That was the original intention. Then we discovered it's only about 10% overhead, and it did catch a lot of bugs. So we said, why not keep this on? And so it's on by default. But if I'm running this in production, I don't need the checksum. Probably not. Uh, 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 Pro I have probably to trust not. you first, and then if I trust Spirit, then... But, for 10%, it's worth paying. I think we should be pedantic in general. There are some scenarios where it's forced to be on, but it does this for you automatically, which is things like if you're adding a unique key in your alter. But the, uh, what is a checksum? What do you compare it to? Uh, CRC32 of rows in both columns, of the intersection of the columns. But wouldn't uh, some other tables uh, potentially change that, right? If I want to change yeah, so, the string to number, right? Yeah, or so we do, a, days, right? we do a cast as well to cast it back to a type that matches. A good example of that that we discovered is when you change like a timestamp to a, like a fractional timestamp, then the string representation is different, so we have to cast it before we text in it. Uh, yep. You mentioned that goals, but not doing copy parallel, and is copy of the rules or applying the changes? Uh, but it does both. We'll get to it. There's some examples where we can't parallel apply the replication changes. Mm -hmm. And, and ask me that question again in like a few slides. Okay. Okay. Uh, just checking if my understanding is correct. So if I understood correctly, you need any because of like double the size of the storage perspective, you want to the same as the new one. Yeah. And you need to do that for everything that basically under space that would be. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, you do need double the size. Yeah, sometimes because of parallelism, uh, not always, but sometimes, uh, the new table can actually be even slightly larger. Yeah, my, my second basically remark was trying to understand if you have like uh, one alpha statement and then second one comes in, what you would do? Yeah, so okay, we. On the, same, on the single table, on the individual table, you can only have one alter table running at once. And you get a panic because while it's subscribing and acting like a replica, it'll see if there's any DDL changes that, that occur on that table. And if so, it won't allow the DDL to finish. Yeah. Um, okay. The checksum algorithm, what is this a custom to you? Uh, CRC32. Yeah, it's because there's a built-in CRC32 function, oh. and then there's a CRC32 aggregate, and that's how we're able to get a basically a chunk, chunk checksum single value, scalar value, and then compare them. So, uh, like, uh, if you like compare that to goals, right? I think it's yeah. said like that. So, uh, where the it, parts in Boulder you need to? Oh, that's yeah. a, that's in the bold, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we are, we are paying about 10% for a checksum, but we, we love it. You can turn it off if you want. It should be safe. We're going to keep it on. Yeah. So, PDOS has a feature that it can wait for replicas for addition. Yeah. Do we have anything similar? We, we do have that. Yeah, we only support fidelity to 10 seconds because generally we're not using read replicas, as I said, because we're financial. So we decided that if we can push that envelope just a little bit, we'll generally get more throughput and we'll complete changes faster. As I said, our goal is like five to ten terabytes schema changes in five days. Um, and in, in your case, I mean, oh, drop on there. Okay, I got more questions on that slide than I expected. Um, oh, one more. Go for it. Yeah, so 
So what happens if the checks are actually paid? Do they try to copy again? Yeah, we do. Yeah, so we'll retry the, the chunk to copy the chunk. And then if it fails after, I think, three or five times, then the schema change is not successful. You get an error. You figure out what you want to do. One last question. Sorry. Yeah. So did you think about, let's say, basically doing only, like, you know, if once you decide that the, let's say, the uh, original copy is now, uh, of the wrong is copied to the new table, do you think it's possible to delete the old one? Well, yeah, we recopy the whole thing on a chunk basis. So it's not recopying the whole thing. We do diff to find the exact row, which mismatched, which can be useful to understand your schema change. Because if you add in something like a unique index on non-unique data, it actually ends up being a checksum failure, which tells you that that was the problem. So that there, there can be a use case actually where a checksum failure is user problem, not internal bug. So um, we frequently have problems doing online schema changes where uh, sorting the tables of the app, which requires a yep. name which requires a metadata on yeah. the table, can be very hard to do on a table that's very busy. Can be. Do you have resilience methods to what? try and get that done? We have something called a sentry. It's not in my slide deck. But basically, we check for the existence of a table, and we'll block and not cut over if that table exists. And then you can choose to drop the sentry at a time which is convenient for you. OK, so that just means I can choose to cut over time. That's right. But if the table is busy all the time, do you have or unpredictably busy, um, do, do, you, do you like try hard to do the cutover repeatedly, or do you just like to It retries the cutover. You can extend the timeouts a little bit. Right. Um, generally, I think if you're in that scenario, uh, I would use the sentry feature. It doesn't try and kill connections. You might want to basically choose a manual time if you're in that scenario, and then try, you know, I think it's like three or five retries. <laughs> You choose like a 30 second timeout, and then you might want to kill connections to ensure it right, right. goes through. Yeah. Okay. How many one patients are like there is can you done at the same time? Only one per table, but there's no limits for how many tables you could be doing at once. So you could have on the same schema three migrations running if you wanted to. Um, we're not doing any sizing based, based on trying to figure out you know, to change concurrency settings too much based on if there's other changes happening. So at least now workflow, we're only doing one at a time, but there's no restrictions to do more. Yeah, but I think the concern is that if you start pushing this, uh, it takes five days, right? So yeah. you, if you want to run if it's a, a schema per customer, for example, uh, approaches, then you need to do that on the same server, of many, many uh, migrations like this. But, Possibly, yeah. I mean, that's going to be custom mission advice. I might skip the question for, for brevity, but thank you. Um, OK, so what are the limitations of this approach? Um, I point out, some of these are limitations of Ghost 2. Some of these we've introduced. Uh, it only supports MySQL 8. You must have a primary key. This is something we introduced, because that's all we, we care about the use cases. That's how we figure out how to chunk the table. Uh, we don't support foreign keys. Basically, foreign key uh, cascading actions don't come via the binary log. So we don't get notification of those updates. We've chosen not to support renaming, because getting the intersection of columns is really hard. Uh, maybe we'll figure that out in the future, but I don't think it's a thing that we care about right now. Don't support triggers. Don't support lossy conversions. So any time when you're trying to you know, lose data, essentially, when you're doing the update, like adding a unique key to non-unique data, it's just basically going to panic and say, I'm not going to do this for you. And uh, the question about your replication fidelity was that we've chosen that we're only going to support down to uh, 10 seconds granularity. I mean, I have to speed up, sorry. <laughs> Optimizations. OK, so this is where uh, it's a little bit uh, spirit specific and it's not so go specific. So uh, we do split copying into chunks, right? I think that's not new. Ghost is doing that. The difference is that we're copying multiple of them at a time. We've chosen the default four, but you know, in many cases, you know. You can pick a number that makes sense to you. Um, even you could pick one if you wanted to. It would still have advantages over uh, Spirit when we get to it. Um, and these, these optimizations describe the copying part of, of tasks. The other big change that we made is that you don't specify how many rows you copy per chunk. You specify how much time each chunk copying um, should take. Um, I thought this would have like a modest improvement. It has a great improvement. To, to performance, actually. Performance and reliability. Because if you consider a table, uh, you know, it could have 100 columns, or it could have 10 columns, or it could have 
10 indexes or it could have one index, right? So the main thing that you care about is you know, how long these chunks are, because that's how much your replica is going to be delayed. That's how long locks are going to be held. So by choosing a time target, we're able to sort of push the envelope a little bit better and be safer. So we call this dynamic chunking. Um, so that's the optimizations instead of copying. We also have some optimizations about how we track the changes from replication. Um, the first change is we call it a delta map, where as long as um, the primary key is what we call memory comparable, i.e. it's not like a bar chart with collations, we just track the primary key, and if the last operation wasn't uh, like an insert update or basically a delete. Basically, delete true or false. And if we do that, you know, when we get to actually applying these changes, we just have to do the last version and know if that's like a replace statement or it's a delete statement from, from the new table. Um, this works pretty well if you have rows you know, frequently re-updated. Um, the one that works better, actually, is this optimization we call key above watermark. So if you imagine that we're copying between 1 and 11, and we know the copier, it's, it's parallel, so we don't know exactly where it's up to in copying. But we know the highest place that it could have copied up to is row number 10. Anything above 10, if it comes to replication, we can throw it away. And then the low watermark is the no one safe part. We use that for another feature, which I'll get to in a slide. But this eliminates a lot of our changes. Because we have auto increment primary keys on just about everything. For the first 90% of the schema migration, we don't have to pay attention to anything that comes to replication. Because most of the inserts, updates, and deletes are on the most frequently or most recently inserted data. Um, I don't know if he's here, but um, Tim gave me this suggestion, who works on Ghost, and it, I was not sure how well it worked. It works great. We sort of have the, the data to, uh, to back this. Um, the other change that I said was related to this is that um, we have checkpointing. So what we do is we, we keep no one safe positions where the copier is guaranteed to have copied up to, the replication applier is guaranteed to have applied, and then every minute we write that to an internal table such that if you know, this process was to crash, we can resume. And we can just re repeat just a little bit of work, lose a minute worth of, of work to be able to, uh, as I said, restart on day 15, not on day one. Um, so we have a problem that if you're running PCI on a machine, that machine no longer is defined. Yeah. The storage is hard. So this puts a recovery even on a different machine. It, it, can, in, uh, it can technically. We don't test for that currently. We don't handle. Uh, no changes, but we could in future. Yeah. Yeah, our main thing is if the process fails, because the runners that we have to run this process are in Kubernetes, and our compute team likes to pod cycle every 24 hours, hence why our 10 day migrations cause us problems. But, but you know, uh, uh, replication. We, we can support it. Yeah. Yeah, and we can support that. We just don't currently advertise it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. And then that gets us to the last section, and I'll, I'll try and go through this quick. So my first feature request is see these changes that, that we do fairly common. Um, I don't really see a good reason why they can't be moved to instant. If they can be moved to instant. Uh, then we'll be able to just basically complete changes very uh, quickly, and we won't have to worry. But if you get drop in the index, right? Yeah, I'll let you know. the only one that I think is controversial is drop index, right? Because drop index is a little bit more than the other ones. Um, but Details in the bug report saying, you know, perhaps that might be the only one that, that has uh, discussion. Um, the other uh, feature request I have is that we can't really use in place at all. I'd love to use in place. Um, we need to have a way for in place to uh, basically not have one long running transaction if it can do this progressively. Um, actually, I can't guarantee that this would allow us to use in place. We might find other issues, but this is just a non starter that we discovered. And my sort of third feature request is that um, of the ones that, that are in uh, the copy area, we do change data type quite a lot, but it's always predictable. We're always changing like an int to an int64. It's always in that direction. So we can use the same magic from instant from MySQL 8, and we can get a change data type to expand the data type. I don't know. You know, I can wish, right? Uh, then I think we can end up in a, in a future scenario where actually we can do a lot of the changes in the MySQL server. Uh, we can use in place for adding index, which is one that I said I'd love to use the server, and we just have to use Spirit for really just you know the, the very small minority of of, uh, of changes. And um, you know maybe maybe that's what the future will look like. What I will say though is that regardless of what the future is, because we always assert and try and do the instant first, 
whatever changes are added by the MySQL team, we'll be able to take advantage. And so, like, you know, biggest company chooses. We'll, we'll be happy with that. So, um, this is why I say Spirit is symbiotic, where it does attempt to use the MySQL server as much as possible. And as the MySQL server is able to do more, I think that's just going to work great. Um, I want to thank you, obviously, for instant DDL. This is the, like, really one of the key uh, features of Spirit to be able to try and get the server to do it first. Uh, and if you'd like to take a look at uh, Spirit, it's available as open source. Okay, thank you.